eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour Hell. Ikuningen. Holy smokes, we're coming in strong with season six. This one with Dr. Tommy Wood is pretty special. We also have the legendary Alan Savory next week. Get ready now by watching his world famous TED talk on YouTube. Dr. Tommy Wood is a full-time research assistant professor at the University of Washington in the Department of Pediatrics. The majority of his academic work is focused on developing therapies for brain injury in newborn infants. His current research interests include the physiological and metabolic response to brain injury, as well as developing easily accessible methods with which to track human health, performance, and longevity. He does this work through academic positions at UW and the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. Tommy received a bachelor's degree in natural sciences and biochemistry from the University of Cambridge before studying medicine at the University of Oxford. He worked as a junior doctor in central London for two years after medical school and then moved to Norway to complete a PhD in physiology and neuroscience at the University of Oslo. Tommy is a former president of the Physicians for Ancestral Health Society and has also coached and competed in multiple sports including growing, crossfit, powerlifting, and ultra-endurance racing. He's got a strong foundation in many areas of health and I think his views are really valuable. Some people get hyper-focused on one or two things, which can be super beneficial and can lead to amazing discoveries, but it could also sometimes cause people to only look at things from one viewpoint or miss the forest for the trees. I love looking at all sides of nutrition and keep trying to evolve my views based on the almost 150 people I've talked to so far. It seems some people just take something that a super smart doctor like Paul Saladino says, who's a good friend of mine, and I mean no disrespect, and take it as the end-all be-all. That's not going to work well in something as complicated as nutrition. I'll take his well-informed interpretation of the body of evidence and then go listen to another super smart and experienced doctor who believes in more plant-heavy approaches and then try to make sense of it all. But I don't have it all figured out either, of course. I'm just confirming my own biases and gravitating towards ideas that fit my views no matter how hard I try not to. The best I've come up through all of this is the sapien diet. It'll be ever-evolving as new information comes to light. Anyway, just listen to this whole episode, even though it's long. I think it's valuable info, and Tommy is up there on my Mount Rushmore of people who I'm totally in line with, like Dr. Ted Naiman. <laughs> Before we jump in, I want to make sure everyone knows about NoseToTail.org, where we ship 100% grass-finished beef and buffalo and high omega-3 pork and chicken to your door. This is all raised beyond organic in Texas. Our primal ground beef with liver, heart, kidney, and spleen is flying out the door these days, so get it while you can. We only process animals every two weeks. There's so many nutrients in this tasty ground beef that are hard to get otherwise. You can get a custom box at nosetail.org and get free shipping if it's 20 pounds or more. You can also support this podcast and everything else I do at patreon.com slash peakhuman. I've been able to scrape by without taking on any advertisers or outside money for any of my ventures so far and really want to keep it that way. The Food Lies film, the Food Lies YouTube channel, and all my social media is powered all by the community. I've yet to take a cent from another company. That's patreon.com slash peakhuman. Or click through sapien.org where you can find out about all the other projects I'm working on, including the health technology. We're still looking for doctors, healthcare providers, and health coaches to work with us. You can add yourself to the waiting list at sapien.org. Thanks for sharing this podcast and reviewing it on iTunes and the Apple Podcast app. Really appreciate all of you and all the inspiring messages of positive health journeys. Now let's hear some more great information from another brilliant mind, Dr. Tommy Wood. All right, Dr. Tommy Wood, we're rolling. I feel like I know you, even though we've never talked before. <laughs> hey, yeah, uh, likewise. See all your stuff on Instagram. We have a good mutual friend in Paul Saladino. So yeah, we've sort of orbited each other for a while without <laughs> yeah. actually connecting. Exactly. And your business partner, Chris Kelly, came down and did a podcast with me and all kinds of stuff. And yeah, Paul even helped us out with some topics that we'll get into later. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, so many things to talk about with you. Why don't you tell the audience your background and why they should listen to you? Because you have a bunch of degrees, you've done all kinds of cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, I was reflecting with a friend of mine yesterday about how if I actually went for like a real job interview formally, people wouldn't know what to think of me because my CV is kind of all over the place. And luckily, instead, I've sort of managed to make relationships and then people have wanted to employ me. And so that's allowed me to do what I do today. So right now, 
I am pretty much a full-time research assistant professor at the University of Washington. My main research is in neonatal brain injuries, so babies born preterm or term, and something happens and those babies are at high risk of then later on having some kind of what we call neurodevelopmental impairments. So maybe they have cerebral palsy or some kind of learning impairments. So that's what I do a lot of my work on. That's what I did my PhD on. But at the same time, I've spent a lot of time working with athletes of various kinds, chronic disease populations of various kinds. So my career kind of encompasses how can you build a healthy person or brain essentially for an entire lifespan. That's, that's kind of where I'm heading. And you can probably tell that I grew up in the UK. I did an undergraduate degree in biochemistry. Then I went to medical school. I worked in London as a doctor for a couple of years before moving to Norway for a PhD. And then I moved over to Seattle after that uh, because my wife is from the US and we both got jobs here in, in Seattle. So when I sort of think about the various things that got me here, when, when I was an undergrad, I sort of started to do a lot of sports type stuff, training myself and then coaching, particularly in rowing. Um, and then when I was at medical school, I was sort of part of a family project because my step brother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Uh, we sort of tried to figure out all the possible things that could be going on in MS in sort of these chronic neurodegenerative disorders. What can we sort of extract from the research? And this was thousands of papers and, you know, engineering models and computer simulations and what sort of falls out is how important the environment is mm. and all the factors, dietary, sleep, toxins, obviously some genetic factors as well, you know, how much that sort of plays into those kind of diseases. So immediately, even though it's not necessarily the focus of my medical studies, this becomes like a really big part of what I start to think about. And then as I sort of went and started working as a doctor, you don't really have that much time to, to think about these things. But when I started my PhD, you know, it's time to sit down, think, do research. And so while I was doing my formal research for my PhD, I was also thinking more about what are the factors that affect, you know, long-term health. And then I started blogs and podcasting. I met Chris Kelly uh, at Nourish Balance Thrive, eventually uh, joined the company and I was there until last year. And so even throughout this entire period, I've been working sort of formal academic research, um, working in the lab, animal models of brain injury, but at the same time working with athletes of various kinds, lots of endurance athletes. I still work, consult with the majority of Formula One drivers, so kind of you know elite level uh, motorsports. And at the moment, I'm just sort of cruising through all these different areas and, and being an academic is really nice because you can basically do whatever you like um, and get paid to do it. So mm. that's essentially where I am now. So I do most of my research in the lab, but then I work with um, some people still, you know, Formula One drivers, some elite weightlifters and bodybuilders, still some, you know, consulting on various chronic disease and performance issues. So all of that kind of comes together. And on a day to day basis, I get to sort of dip my toe into all of those worlds. I love that. I love that. It really keeps me in check. I thought I was cool for doing a few things and, <laughs> you know, like being sort of a multifaceted guy and you're just destroying me. That's awesome. My wife likes to joke that I can never have less than three jobs at any one time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of value in that. I've yeah. done many things in my career. I've changed careers. I've gotten all kinds of experience. I've just do it all at a more pedestrian level than you. So uh, I think that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you're an athlete yourself. You're a big, strong guy. You're kind of doing it all. So, so many things to dive into. Even, well, I didn't know too much about this MS stuff. I just listened mm. to Terry Walls with Paul Saladino, which is really yeah. interesting. And I actually met one of her patients, was Paleo FX last year, who was walking around. She's normal. She cured her MS with the Terry cool. Walls protocol. So yeah. yeah, maybe just talk about that for a second. It's so cool. Yeah, sure. So like I sort of gave a bit of information on this was, it was kind of like a family engineering project. So my stepbrother was diagnosed. My stepdad at the time was a chemical engineer. And, and my wife is also a chemical engineer. And what they're really good at better than pretty much anybody else is problem solving. So when you have a complex system and you want to know about flows through the system, inputs and outputs, then chemical engineers are really the best people to approach that. And that works for the body as well as it does for some kind of like processing plant or oil refining, which is what some of them spend their time doing. Mm -hmm. So we approach the problem in a similar manner. And all these things, again, start to pop out. So, you know, chronic infections and um, environmental toxins and nutrient availability and, you know, sleep and stress and, and all that kind of stuff. And 
we sort of built these models and these big causal loop diagrams, we call them sort of huge feedback loops and how the whole system sort of intersects or how we sort of see that from the literature. And then at exactly the same time that we don't know about her at the time is Terry Walls is doing all this stuff with herself, essentially. And the model that falls out and the recommendations were very similar uh, from what we did and, and what she did. And she's obviously, you know, made this you know, the main focus of her career, both because of, you know, herself and then the people that she's worked with. And she's written a fantastic book. And she's absolutely the go to expert on this nowadays. But what was really powerful to me was that two different groups of people with completely different skill sets and backgrounds essentially arrived at the same answer you mm -hmm. know well, there are some differences right they're always going to be but but the overall idea was very similar and I, and I think when something like that happens then it really shows you that there's, a, there's some real power um in those ideas so you know i'm not a neurologist i've never been anybody's doctor as somebody with multiple sclerosis but we've certainly worked with or spoken to a large number of people who've then incorporated these processes in conjunction with their neurologist you know including my my stepbrother and, you know, seeing really quite dramatic Im improvements and it, it covers all the same stuff in terms of nutrient density and removing, you know, various uh, foods that are likely to be causing issues in the diet and sleep and stress and, you know, looking for chronic infections or, you know, detoxification is kind of a, a dodgy area to enter into mm -hmm. if you want to, but potentially some of that as well. So heavy metals can be a big issue in some uh, neurodegenerative disorder. So all of that stuff, identifying what's relevant to the person and attacking those things can can really uh, be, be beneficial. Yeah, it's multifactorial. What do you mm. think about her diet? Exactly. Did you listen to that episode with Paul and her and they kind of went back and forth on the plant versus animal components? But I mean, it's similar. It's an ancestral diet mm. using nose to tail animals, but she just adds in more like kale. She's really into her vegetables, but that worked for her and she she talked all about it. And I'm just wondering, wait, what do you think? Yeah. So when she presents her diet, when she was first presenting it you know, several years now, there's a TED talk and some, some other talks that she gave, but you know, she really focuses on how many cups of vegetables and the different colors and why those are important for, you know, particularly mitochondrial health. Um, and that's obviously been a big focus of, of her version of the diet. And she's seen dramatic effects. Uh, you definitely can't argue with that. I think that removing the things that are potentially detrimental in the diet and that's obviously going to be uh, grains uh, dairy you know potentially eggs and legumes so sort of like a, a strict autoimmune paleo type approach is kind of what we um, would usually recommend to, to people at least as a starting point mm -hmm. i think removing those potentially detrimental foods particularly in that population there's some interesting data that's looked at uh, circulating antibodies in people with ms and there seems to be some cross reactivity between the antibodies that your body makes against certain proteins in the brain you know that's the autoimmune process that's happening in the brain of people with ms and those antibodies seem to cross react uh, with other proteins so those could be uh, from casein or from gluten uh, you know so particularly dairy and wheat should be the first to go then you know there's also some cross reacting with certain um, uh, bacterial or, or microbial antigen. So that's where some of the chronic infection starts to come in with molecular mimicry. So I think removing those foods is important. Mm -hmm. And then obviously making sure that you have access to all the nutrients that are really important uh, for brain health and brain repair. And that's almost, you know, the vast majority of that is going to come from, from animal foods. So I think I'm not particularly bothered either way about the, uh, the plant content. Some people enjoy that as part of the diet and if they feel good, that's great. But I think removing the detrimental foods, foods and making sure that all the nutrients are available are probably the most important things. And then, and then later on, some of that, that other stuff comes into play. Yeah, that's what all good diets, I think it's mainly what you are not eating. Exactly, and then, yeah. And then of course, it's like having mm -hmm. adequate nutrition. So yes, mm -hmm. you can do a carnivore or vegan diet with adequate nutrition. Well, I never pr really promote vegan pure vegan diets, but you can be 99% plant-based <laughs> if you get all the right nutrient-dense foods that are bioavailable and whatever supplementation. Well, these diet wars are so such a big topic these days, and I'm super interested in them. I love listening to Paul's mm -hmm. views and hearing all different sides of this. What do you think? I mean, I, in this broad strokes, yeah, in, specific. In, we, can, we can definitely get into the specifics, but where I stand is that humans genetically omnivores. And what that means is we are able to thrive on a wide variety of diets. And that is exactly where these wars then stem from, because mm -hmm. people are surviving and thriving on this huge range of diets. 
that's how we're built. You know, we are supposed to be able to survive pretty much based on whatever we put in our mouths. That's one of the reasons we became the apex predator. And, you know, we spread across the, the globe. We're, yeah, we've spread across the globe. Everywhere. You know, we've, we've dominated the globe because we're able to survive in any environment, almost any environment and eating almost any food. And so like that is the basis of what makes us human. And from there, people ideologically finding various reasons to eat certain ways. And as humans, again, one of our key attributes is that we make decisions based on emotion and then we back rationalize them, right? So mm -hmm. we make some decision like we're going to eat carnivore, or we're going to eat vegan, and it's largely an emotional decision. And then we go hunting for research to support that. And I think most people are, are doing that and are capable of doing that because of the vagaries of human uh, nutrition research, which is generally pretty useless. So, so you can always find something to, to back up your point. And when it comes to some of these chronic you know, diseases, neurodegenerative disorders, autoimmune disorders, I think there are a number of foods that seem to be affecting people and contrib contributing to that disease process, whether that would always have been the case or whether that's part, that's also partially a product of the modern environment. I just don't know. Um, but what I see and what I feel is that when, so say carnivores who are largely intolerant of plants, I find that very interesting because I think humans should be able to survive and potentially thrive with some plants in their diet. It's just part of who we are. Mm -hmm. So if there's some sensitivity to that, if you cannot tolerate those, there's something else there going on either historically or in that person's environment that's driving that lack of robustness. And that's what I find particularly interesting. So when people are doing great on those diets, I would never argue with it. You know, fantastic. Track your markers, things that are going to be useful, you know, to look at your long-term health. But if you feel good, sleep good, all that stuff, I wouldn't argue with any diet. But when it's, you know, there's some interesting stuff I believe we should be able to tolerate, but you can't tolerate. I find that interesting. It doesn't mean I can solve that problem if it is a problem to solve. But that's kind of where I sort of intersect across all those different, mm. all those different diets. Oh no, that's perfect! And another great Seattle person, Dr. Ted Naiman, oh, yeah. always <laughs> says, "I want to be anti-fragile. I don't want to yeah. be, have like one you bite a sweet potato and you know fall over or like <laughs> you know like run to the bathroom or something. Like this is not how I want to live. And I love that that something else may be going on." And then mm. maybe you can fix that and then add the different foods back in. So I should bring up my little experiment. I'm not a carnivore person, but I am a heavy animal-based person. I've always sort of been in this 90% animal-based range. Well, not more recently, once I really discovered, you know, the power of, you know, animal foods and <laughs> understood this more and wasn't scared of them like the mm. rest of the public. But I did a brief experiment last year, but, you know, just for the past week, I just went strict carnivore because I wanted to see what it was like and nothing changed, zero change. Yeah. And I know how I feel like I'm very in tune with, you know, how I feel, how I sleep, my energy levels, all kinds of stuff. And it was the same. But I think that's because when I started my little sapien thing, which is 90 percent animal foods by calories, plus some avocado, mushrooms, fermented vegetables and some onions. I feel like I'm getting all the benefits of the carnivore diet, but I'm also getting some of these benefits from these plant foods that I specifically chose that I think are nutrient dense and have low anti-nutrients and mm. are beneficial to me and have, you know, vitamin C, fermented foods have a lot of vitamin C. You know, I want some of these bits of plant materials in my body. I don't know if I'm hedging my bets or what. There's multiple reasons why I even just want to be anti-fragile, right? I want to be able to maintain my gut microbiome so I can continue to eat these plant foods. I talk about this all the time. I, I'll be on a, out at a wedding and I'll eat what's served to me, right? I'm not scared yeah. to eat some foods on the weekend that aren't exactly perfect because mm. my body can handle them. And I think Paul heard this when I first started talking to him like a year ago about, it's like, yeah, it's almost like I'm keeping my gut microbiome intact by eating some of these foods just for that purpose of being flexible and normal. Yeah, you and I probably eat in a very similar manner. I, I, pr I probably, you know, I occasionally have whatever it is that's that's put in front of you. It's a few refined carbohydrates or or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think not those are particularly healthful. In fact, I know that they're not. But the ability to tolerate them, enjoy them in a social setting, and have them, you know, not really cause any downstream effects, I think is potentially important. It shows some robustness of the human physiology. It's like it's um. 
I get it's very similar to the idea of metabolic flexibility, right? You should just yeah. be able to use whatever fuel, be that based on macronutrients or you know where the food is coming from, that's put into the system. You know, a robust human physiology should be able to do that. And there's been a few times when I've gone, you know, keto for several weeks and. Other than the fact that I'm not hungry, so I find it really difficult to eat enough food to maintain my body weight. Mm-hmm. I, you know, just I never get keto flu. It never affects my sleep. It's just like I can go in and out, no problem. And I think that that's a sign of a fairly healthy metabolism, and that's probably something that that most humans should be able to do. Exactly. I do the same thing with keto as with like animal foods, or just I can do strict carb. I go in and out. And I don't ever measure, but I know I can do well with any fuel source. And I think that's the ultimate goal. And, you know, yeah. I love Mark Sisson always, you know, talking about this and tipping me off to this. But so, yeah, I kind of just to clean this up, I did go through maybe some transition a year ago when I started my sapien thing, going to this high animal foods. I do remember some sort of bad effects, a little GI effects or just some... Mm-hmm. You know, I felt different or, you know, there's adjustment phase, right? There's always, so I think I already did that adjustment phase. I was already basically in this sort of carnivorous realm. And then, so me going hundred percent carnivore did zero, did nothing except mm-hmm. for make me feel limited. And I just didn't like it. And I stopped after a week. I was going to do it for a couple of weeks, but I was just like, what is the point? I mean, I feel zero difference. It's been a full week. <laughs> I'm just just wishing I could eat like a little kimchi or like a sauerkraut. It's like, what's the big deal? Like having a slice of avocado, like, come on. So I think this is my one pushback to this world. I just don't want the carnivore community to be like the vegan community because Mm, we always make fun of them. They're like, oh yeah, of course you feel better because you went from McDonald's to eating whole foods. And so it's like, I think this is since I did this experiment, I have this new little thought. It's like, hey, what if these, you know, carnivores, they're, they're so dogmatic about it or they believe in it, this magical thing. And it's like, well, if you went 90% carnivore from your bad diet or even your decent diet, you could still have all the benefits. What do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. And I know that Paul would then say, but what, what is the actual benefit? What's the evidence that you're getting benefit from those vegetables? And in reality, would, we would just have to talk about theories, right? Because none of it is provable, at least based on what, uh, the information we have available and we have to sort of put our put our hands up other than trying to build, you know, robustness in the system, which I think is important. But you're right. This is exactly the same thing happens, right? You go on a diet. It works really well for you. Is it because of the thing you are eating more of or is it because of the things that you're no longer eating? It's probably more of the latter, like we talked about earlier. And you just need to be really sort of open and honest about that process. So what I do like about Paul's approach is that it obviously works for him. He's researched why plants may not be beneficial. I don't think there's really any strong signal to say that humans shouldn't eat plants. Um, Mm -hmm. And and I would argue that probably evidence is for the opposite, just again, from that sort of like theoretical robustness uh, standpoint. But he would also say, if you're healthy and things are good, regardless of what diet you're eating, I'm not going to argue with that. I'm not going to say you need to be carnivore. What I think what's potentially different about a lot of the people who are in this world compared to you, say, you're always relatively healthy, right? You've Mm -hmm. you've never suffered from a significant chronic disease, you know, similar to myself. We've been lucky. Mm -hmm. Unlike others who find a diet because they're trying to solve some long-standing problem. So then once you get to that point and you feel amazing, you're going to push so much harder against people saying that you shouldn't be eating that way when you're somebody like us who've sort of like navigated our way through this without having to deal with any significant problem, you know, potentially you're you're a different kind of animal at that point. So it's just, you know, just because something works for you, I think just being open and honest and, you know, you could have two people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and one goes vegan, you know, whole food plant-based is a better, is a better phrase Mm -hmm. for the good way of doing it and knows to tell carnivore. Maybe, you know, both lose weight, both improve from a health standpoint. They can't tell the other person that, that they shouldn't be eating the way they're eating because if they're doing better and feeling good, then there's, there's nothing we could do about that. So sort of putting that emotion into the argument doesn't make any sense. I think we need to find what works for us and then we can talk about the reasons why that might be the case. But you know, arguing over the minutiae of whether fiber is or isn't good for you is interesting, but it's not necessarily that useful if, if the person in front of you is, is feeling better mm. and their bowels are working and all that stuff, right? You know, it's, it's just sort of <laughs> yeah. like a, it's, te- it's technical stuff that doesn't really make any difference at that point. Absolutely. And I guess the the biggest takeaway is I know everyone loves to say everyone, everyone's different. It works for you. It works for you. All this type of stuff. 
But there's one more level of nuance I think people should go into is that, like you said, question, don't make it based on a belief. Question it. It's like, okay, yes, carnivore diet worked for you. Fantastic. But maybe just question just because it's working for you now doesn't mean it's the healthiest Mm. thing possible or that you can't have avocado and, you know, a little bit of dark chocolate or whatever. I don't know. Just, you know, maybe this will be a little bit healthier. You can get a little more vitamin C from, yes, you can get it from liver, but maybe you're not eating liver every week. You know, like Paul, like maybe you do need some different sources of vitamin C from plants or maybe there are some benefits that we don't know about. So just be open to this and don't just because it worked for you. That's just this like magic shield. You know, people just yeah. throw up like, oh, works for me. You can't say a single thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like this automatic shut up. Get away from me. Like, OK. And when there's, when there's four million plus potential iterations of diets that you could be eating, right? Mm-hmm. Just just the one that's working for you, there could be another million that could work for you, including various nuances and changes <laughs> yeah. from where you are, right? You just, you don't know. So you can't then argue against it. Be curious, be open-minded. I'm always going to be open-minded. That's, I've never bought into any camp. I'm, I just even call the Sapien framework. It's like every good diet fits into the Sapien framework, really, except for <laughs> veganism yeah. or for the standard American diet. I mean, it's like any good diet kind of fits. So yeah. here's my kind of take on it. I've talked about this a few times. I put a post out last year, a visual. Think of this visually. Plant foods, processed foods, animal foods. I kind of just split them up into three categories. I think plant foods are kind of just neutral. They're kind of like a zero. And processed Mm -hmm. foods are a negative one. And animal foods are a plus one. Mm -hmm. Like, just think about that for a second. Like, there's a whole array of foods, though. It's like you can go to the the worst of the worst. Like you could have like a donut cooked in three week old soybean oil, you know, with extra GMO <laughs> flour, with sugar harvested by like a child slave in Barbados, you know. And this is like the negative one. This is the worst. And then the very top, like grass finished, regeneratively grown beef liver topped with salmon roe from a pristine fjord in Nova Scotia with an oyster from the lost city of Atlantis, like perfection. Mm -hmm. The, you know, the most nutrient dense food in the planet is a plus one. And there's Mm -hmm. a whole array of foods. And a lot of the animal foods are, you know, close to a plus one. Maybe they're like a 0.9, 0.8, you know, they're kind of clustered up there, but there could be down in the negatives. I feel like most plant foods just hover around zero. You know, some of them, maybe I'll put my, you know, my like sauerkraut and my mushrooms and avocado is like a plus point two or I don't even know how big they are. What do you think about that? Where where some people get caught up into just all plants are bad and all meat is good, but it, maybe it's just more of this spectrum that I laid out. Yeah, so I would definitely agree with that. I think you're probably one of the only other people I know who thinks similarly to to what I do, which is that the vast majority of plants are probably just pretty neutral in the diet. I was with Paul at a conference I ran in Scottsdale last month, and there were three of us, me, Paul, and and one of the other doctors who who was there. And the other doctors like plants are probably positive and Paul's like plants are probably negative. And I'm just like, meh, they're probably like, don't really necessarily do that much. In reality, like when you look, it's super interesting. When you look at like randomized controlled trials of just adding plants to the diet, meh, nothing really happens. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's no like observable, you know, benefit. And of course, these are, you know, pretty short term. So you can't really say, well, if you eat an extra salad a day for, 50 years is that going to be beneficial you know we don't really know and the nutritional epidemiology literature really cannot help us answer that question so the interventional data is is kind of a wash really if if you ask me so i think there's definitely going to be some that are going to be more detrimental and again you know very much depending on the person so if you have a long history of antibiotic use you probably have no oxalobacter in your gut microbiota so then anything that's high in oxalates is going to be more detrimental to you you're not gonna be able to clear those or metabolize those as an example and i think it's it's also interesting to think about how many populations in the world hunter gatherers and i've never really like truly researched this but how often is it that people just eat raw leaves like Mm -hmm. salad probably never right humans just don't eat raw leaves in the wild as far can as I, I jump know. in for a second? Yeah. I talked to Stefan Guianet and he wrote The Hungry Brain and he talked mm-hmm. about this kind of research, the Hadza. So he's a plant person, but he mentioned, yeah. you know, we study the Hadza and there's an optimum foraging theory. Mm-hmm. They didn't collect all these plant leafy greens and all that. They collected meat and tubers and honey. 
Like mm-hmm. these were yeah. high caloric value for the effort put in and they did not care for or collect a whole bunch of leaves. And and what you what I think traditional cultures do do if they do use leaves, it's as either a seasoning or a tea or for some, you know, some medicinal, medicinal purposes, yeah. right? And so that's the kind of in that kind of context, you know, maybe plants have a, a net benefit, but like thinking that like a whole extra bowl of salad is going to do much. I think it's it adds bulk, it adds fiber. Do you need that fiber? I mean, if you completely restrict your gut microbiota from anything fermentable or ketones to then support, you know, healthy epithelial cells, so like no fiber, no collagen, no other sort of gristly bits, and you know, you're not sort of in ketosis, which can sort of help support that system, that's probably going to be a bad thing. But there are so many different ways that you can then help that system that you don't just need to say, well, plant fiber is going to do that for you. So if, if you're not doing any of that, that's probably a bad thing. But then again, that scenario is very much a standard American diet, heavily processed foods, nothing really good that's going to be useful to your gut microbiome. So it's all going to be absorbed very quickly high up in the gut. Um, and you know that's when, when problems start to happen. But there's so many different ways to skin that cat. That as long as you're eating real food, I don't think it is necessarily that much of an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So after talking to so many people, I would say I talked to about 150 people by now, just of all kinds, trying to figure this stuff out. And that's the one true commonality is just eat whole foods, right? And you, yeah. I know you yeah. say just if it looks like food, eat it, like that kind of thing. That's the mm-hmm. simplest thing. I mean, we can just walk away from nutrition. <laughs> yeah. really, you know, we're just like, we figured it out. It's just, it's not that cool. It's not that yeah, uh, exactly. interesting, but we just have to keep saying it. But I'm really into this processing of food. And I just talked to Mark Schatzker, wrote The Dorito Effect, had a great podcast mm-hmm. with him last week. But this is what I've come to through all the people I've talked to is that all that really matters is the level of processing the food. It's like the alteration, how much you alter the food. It's all that matters. You can have any ratio of whole foods, any macros, any plant to animal ratio. And <laughs> if you're eating whole foods, it doesn't matter, right? You can be healthy. You don't, it, we make it so complicated, but the problem is yeah. no one eats solely whole foods for their whole life. So if they did, maybe they could tolerate all these fruits mm. and meat, you know what I mean? But if you're, in this modern world that's totally different. But so just processing a food, are you really there with, you know, I, I said the plants may be around the zero, the animal foods are the plus one. It, it's kind of like any good diet, no matter how much plants you have, you're getting the plus one from the animal foods, right? So that's like those oysters that a pescatarian eats are hugely beneficial. Mm-hmm. And any good diet avoids all the negative ones of the processed yeah. foods. So are you really there with that food processing type of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's plenty of research, I, I believe, to, to support that. And, and what happens when you process foods? And if you're looking for another good person to, to interview, uh, Gabor Adosi. I got him, actually. Great... Oh, I cool. got him. Yeah, he was back in um, the day. People can look up that episode. I love it. Yeah. So, and, and he's talked a lot about uh, processed food. And I've, I've, I've found a lot of papers on food processing because of the stuff that he posts. And basically, what happens when you process food is you dissociate the hormonal and metabolic response to the food and the satiety response to the food from the macronutrient content. If you process a legume or a grain, um, you know, so it's largely carbohydrates, you'll get maybe a similar or slightly larger glycemic index, but a much larger insulin response. Or you'll get completely different responses to uh, the incretins in the gut, which kind of regulate both hormone release and also satiety. And so what your body is, is expecting in terms of a macronutrient and calorie load from the food results in a completely different hormonal response. And mm-hmm. from there, you get changes in satiety, you get um, changes in you know, large fluctuations in blood sugar. That's where you start to see the problems because you are no longer able to control um, intake and or regulation because what you're expecting is not the response that, that you get from the food. And it's the same with carbohydrates. It's the same with fat. If you, you know largely refine fat, probably uh, increases metabolic endotoxemia, so crossing of endotoxins from bacteria in the gut into the bloodstream, which causes an inflammatory response. Refined oils and refined fats, as problematic as refined uh, carbohydrates. I probably, you know, refined protein, so like a whey protein is also going to cause a larger insulin response, you know, based on the amount of protein that you're having compared to, say, eating a steak. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm less worried about the protein side of things than the fat and the carbohydrate. I think, you know, refining 
fats and oils and carbohydrates is, is where you see this really big difference in terms of the effect on your physiology versus what should be happening based on the, the caloric and, and the macronutrient load that the body is expecting. Yeah, great presentation by Gabor Dosi on YouTube. Talks about this and the protein isn't really the problem. And part of the mm. problem is just breaking the structural wall of the carbohydrate or the plant that really matters, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I heard you talk about this was really cool. Your brain can regulate food if it's less than one and a half calories per gram. Mm. If, if it's super calorically dense, it's hard for your brain, for you to self-regulate with your satiety. So how does this work and how, what kind of foods? I mean, obviously processed foods are the ones that have the higher <laughs> density. Yeah, exactly. And so that is, is between like one and a half to two calories per gram is where, again, it's, it's what is the body expecting versus what's the hormonal response to it? You can only may accept maybe honey is going to be the exception. Mm. I, I can't think of any whole food where there isn't some water or fiber or something else that's making it well below that limit. Mm -hmm. um, if you're then just thinking, well, I want to, I want my body to be better at self-regulating appetite, then just consume foods that are below one and a half calories per gram, which is essentially just any whole food. Mm -hmm. uh, then you'll be in that region. And then your body will start to take over. And, and I always think about the fact that, you know, biohacking, super popular, has been for several years now, which is basically the idea that we are more intelligent than our bodies and we can kind of like trick it into doing things that um, it wouldn't otherwise do through technology. But I don't really think that we're smart enough to do that in general. Mm -hmm. But what the body is very good at doing is that if you put it in an environment that it expects and understands, you will get a good outcome. And so that includes the food that you put in it, that includes light in the day, darkness at night, it includes some movement, it includes social connection, all of that stuff, you put your body in, in an environment that it evolved in, appetite regulation, body weight regulation, mood, you know, inflammatory processes, all of that will start to, you know, figure itself out. And we're really not in a place where we can start to override that through medications or biohacking or anything. We just don't really understand understand the system well enough, but it understands itself well enough that you just create the environment. And most of that stuff will happen. Of course, people with very complex chronic diseases will require different things. But in general, if you're talking about the Pareto principle mm -hmm. for, you know, 80-20, like that's that's where you're going to see most of the benefit. I love that. Yeah, everything falls into place. And uh, yeah, we, our society gets a little too caught up in out engineering and out medicating problems when you have to take a step back and just <laughs> go with nature and it's so simple i guess it needs to be brought up more that these other lifestyle factors are super important because i always get focused mm. on the diet stuff and then yeah, some yeah. of the movement but so yeah we can talk about it. i'm super into getting sunlight right and i walk my yeah. dog and i go get sun during the middle of the day and get all this vitamin d and sleep i think that the biggest problem I don't know if we need to do a million biohacks and, you know, <laughs> some of these blue blocking glasses, some company contacted me like, oh, we'll send you a pair. And I kind of politely declined. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's good. I just don't want to get into that, that level. I think most people just aren't getting enough sleep because they're not giving themselves a chance to get enough sleep. They have mm -hmm. an alarm yeah. that's at 6 a.m. So what do you think? I just think, yes, there could be some completely, maybe you need to turn off the devices at night before you go to bed, I was up late working and I couldn't go to sleep. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I was trying to work at midnight. It's probably not great why I couldn't go to sleep right away. But I think it's just people need to give themselves a lot. Of, I used to just give myself six hours of sleep and it wasn't because I was looking at a blue light. It was because I <laughs> went to sleep at midnight and I had a 6 a.m. alarm. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. I think that's what most people are doing. They're sort of you know, your kids go to bed at a certain time and then you want alone time and a glass of wine and you want to sit down and watch Netflix and then it's midnight and then you have to get up at 6am. So just not giving yourself enough time in bed, one of, again, in, in the general population, one of the biggest problems. You need to give yourself at least eight hours in bed, if not nine. I personally do like the blue, blo uh, blue blocking glasses, but at this point, for both me and my wife, who was initially resistant, but now now use, uses them, um, mm -hmm. It's, it's almost like a Pavlovian effect, right? Like the glasses go on and you're like, yep, it's bedtime. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of like helps stimulate that process of getting into bed. Because also like most of our work is done on computers and you may be working late at night. I do. So I use Flux on my computer yeah. you know, after sundown I and I use, I use um, blue light blocking glasses. And in an ideal world, 
the lights would come on or we'd go outside when the, when the sun rises and we do usually do that because our, then when the sun rises, the, the dog wants to get up and, and go outside. So then we have become much better at going to bed early. So we're usually in bed sometime between eight and nine o'clock. If you eat very close to dinner time, then you don't sleep as well. That's fairly well understood. So then, you know, dinner needs to be at like six, six thirty at the latest. And then once you put those kind of things in place, like getting enough time in bed and getting enough sleep, I think becomes really easy, but you need to kind of have that structure in place. But the most important thing, absolutely, just making sure you're in bed for enough time to get the sleep that you need. Mm -hmm. And then are you a big like sunlight person too? Yeah, sadly, living in Seattle makes it tricky (laughs) at at times. Um, And, you know, I've definitely thought about UV boxes, particularly like in the morning, in the winter time, and then maybe, you know, some some red light exposure at night. And in an ideal world, I'd probably do that stuff just to like try it out. But I, I haven't implemented those things yet. I think there's potential mm-hmm. power in that for, for some people. Um, but yeah, so when when the sun is out, like it is today in Seattle, so early on, you know, the sun was up around, well, I guess it was close to seven, but then at like nine o'clock, I was outside on the deck in the sunlight with my dogs for like 20 minutes, just sort of like tell my body that it's that it's daytime and there's there is some nice evidence to suggest that if you get bright light exposure during the daytime when there's supposed to be bright light then again you are more resistant to the effects of blue light at night and it Mm. potentially improves um sleep quality so everybody worries about blue light at night darkness at night but in reality the other side of that is you also need bright light during the day to really set the rhythm correctly Exactly. And yeah, I do do the Flux app and I do do some of the stuff. I just don't want to become like a robot person with a million <laughs> contraptions on my body. <laughs> Absolutely. So maybe I, yeah. Hey, man, there's so many more technical things to get into. I feel like you're like this researcher. So Chris Kelly came in and we talked about Nourish, Bounce, Thrive, which I guess you're not super involved in anymore. But no. you guys were doing working with elite athletes and doing all kinds of blood testing and all kinds of stuff. But it sounded cool because it wasn't sort of bogus blood testing where or like genetic testing, where like, you know, it's stuff that's practical and very actionable. So what's going on there? What yeah. do you still do? Yeah. So I, I still apply, you know, very similar principles with the athletes that I still work with. What's the main group I probably work with currently is the Formula One drivers. And I'm not mm-hmm. directly coaching those guys, although I do have meetings with them. I mainly work with their coaches who are basically like mm. a full time body man for training, you know, massage, carrying stuff, organizing stuff. It's like, you know, it's this sort of semi glamorous job that these guys get, but it's incredibly hard work. They're sort of the, they're the go-to person for everything that the driver needs. So I usually mm-hmm. work with, with those guys. And what's interesting about that world is that the capacity to do extra stuff is almost non-existent. So to add an extra tool, add an extra habit or, you know, an extra requirement or supplement, you you need a really high level of evidence to support why they should be doing this or Mm. else it's going to be like, I'm I'm not going to do it. Mm. And what's good about that is that it forces you to actually make sensible decisions about what you should be doing. Whereas in other groups and again, you know, some of the elite endurance athletes that I've worked with and, you know, again, it's sort of in the, the biohacker cognitive performance, um, kind of sphere um they'll just do everything right like whatever you (laughs) recommend they're like yep i'll take it i'll buy it or i've got all of that already and so what's nice about working with these other groups is you have to be really focused and always underpins all of this stuff all those things that we talked about that are required i believe to maintain long-term health in the average person those things are also required for an underpinning of strong athletic performance especially if you want longevity in your sport. You can always train a certain way and, and push yourself really hard to get excellent or you know world-class performance in a short period of time. But if you want to sustain that performance, then those, those things that we talked about, sleep and, and nutrition and, and um, stress management, uh, social connection, I think all of that is, is required. So putting those foundations in place are always going to be by far the most important thing. And I've definitely rolled back on some of the testing that that I previously recommended you do a lot of stool testing, Dutch testing for hormones and cortisol and stuff. And, and in reality, I've kind of really gone back to back to just blood testing. And that's because we understand those markers so much better. We have some really great data to support a certain marker might be associated with what you might want to do to affect that um, in terms of 
both athletic performance, but also long-term health. So that's where a lot of my focus has, has gone down on. So it's kind of like all the fancy testing is is nice. And again, it's one of those things that's interesting if you work in a functional medicine or integrative medicine kind of sphere. Mm-hmm. But in the end, it's for most people, it's not particularly useful. It's just a waste of money. So, so some really good basic blood testing is where we would always focus. And then there's a lot of information that you can extract out of that. And I think that you know the standard normal range that your doctor uses is usually pretty useless and but there is loads of nice evidence in the published literature on even changes in a blood marker within the normal range and some long-term health outcomes so if you understand really what's published out there you don't need to be making this stuff up based just on your own experience then you get a much better idea of what something something you could tweak be it a supplement or a a lifestyle change or something that then might change that and you can track that over time and then, and then hopefully expect some some long-term improvement but it sort of gives you a little bit of feedback that that the things that you're doing are, are actually working yeah that's great what kind of blood panels do you do and how detailed do you get you can get as detailed as you want um mm-hmm. and usually it's driven by cost um mm-hmm. and so i think basic metabolic panel comprehensive metabolic panels so you have liver function and and the electrolytes and the red blood cell metrics. So you have a um, a CBC with differentials. So all the different red blood cell and white blood blood cell metrics. There's a huge amount of information you can extract out of that. Iron studies are usually really important. Even just some basic lipids are nice. If you can get some slightly more advanced lipids, ApoB, LDL particle, you know, that would be nice too. I don't think it's essential. You know, if you're Mm -hmm. you're just like looking for the most basic, I think particularly – one interesting thing is that when when you're looking at this data that's that's published is ethnicity plays a big role so we have some of the best data available on blood glucose fasting blood sugar and long-term health outcomes but the best data is in this really big south korean data set so we're kind of extrapolating if we're then saying this applies to everybody else we think it is probably the case because blood sugar is one thing that Actually, you know, we have some really great data for um, in terms of both fasting blood sugar and HbA1c and and long term outcomes. But then, when you look at something like the lipids, most lipid research, you know, historically has been done in Caucasian people, in white people. So then, some of the stuff that we use, like say the triglyceride to HDL ratio, is really only really useful in Caucasians. And in, in other ethnicities, it starts to sort of break down. You do need mm. to take some of that into consideration. And you know, liver enzymes also similarly, you know liver enzymes much less of a worry in caucasians than in some south asian populations it does get complicated very quickly and you know there's definitely potential to automate some of this stuff so that's something that i was previously working with um with chris on as you mentioned that you can start to you know maybe build bigger patterns or build some some machine learning models to predict some of this stuff i don't think we're good enough at doing that yet but you know with time and more experience, I think that's probably where we're going to go. That you can, you can build a tool that really tells you about what what's going on again, based on ethnicity and all these other things. And with a fairly cheap amount of a blood test data, you can then sort of extrapolate um, some more interesting things. So you know, hopefully, that's something that we're able to do in the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I'm glad you brought up the triglyceride to HDL ratio. I didn't know there was difference with ethnicity. Mm. So for one, is that kind of your gold standard with the lipids? And also, what is the difference between the nationalities? Yeah, so in reality, we would usually say that a triglyceride to HDL ratio of less than two um, is probably ideal. Some people might be a bit tighter than that, like one to 1.5. In reality, you're only going to get there if you are on a, a ketogenic diet, I think, mm. with a high, you know, so you have very low triglycerides because you have a low uh, refined carbohydrate intake or low carbohydrate intake. And then a lot of saturated fat might then increase your your HDL level. So under two is definitely would be a general population target. It is a really nice marker because when you then look in, like you dig down into some other areas associated with lipids. So if you look at one of the original statin trials, the 4S trial, they in one publishing the data, they separated people into into I think it was quartiles. So Mm -hmm. equal size groups of you know 25% of people and those who had the best or lowest quartile um, or they may have done it based on pre-arranged cutoffs if you had a low triglyceride to HDL ratio then regardless of your LDL you didn't really benefit from a statin so there are some things so it's a really nice overall picture of of metabolic health and it may give you some idea of you know are the these other things that are going on are they something I should be worrying about and 
diving into to lipids and cardiovascular diseases is like a whole other kettle of fish that I am doing some research on because I don't know the answer to a lot of the questions that people have. Mm. Um, as in, we are actively going to do some research in in people and, and look at their arteries over time. Mm. Um, but it's a nice marker of of uh, metabolic health. But again, 4S trial was based in Scandinavia, so it was all in Caucasians. And you see, so African-American populations, they've started to look at this. And you probably need, uh, you know, a tighter ratio, uh, uh, like rate. closer to yeah, one. Tighter, yes, it's going to be below 1.5 or close to one. And that's because triglycerides don't elevate as much in, in African-American populations. But, you know, once they get to like pre-diabetic or diabetic stages. But again, the correlation isn't quite as tight either. So you could use a narrower range, but you're also going to have to accept that it's not going to be quite as as, as predictive or, or as useful. And you know, you see that in, in in lots of in lots of other markers. So if you look at BMI or waist to hip ratio, Caucasians are really good at getting fat before they get uh, pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes. Mm, whereas like a greater personal fat threshold. Fat threshold, yeah. And there's lots of stuff that goes into that, which is super interesting. Like overall inflammatory burden can definitely modulate your personal fat threshold, which is why it's not a perfect predictor. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, talking in broad strokes, white people get fatter before they get metabolic syndrome. Um, so then you, you need tighter ratios for African-Americans or Asian populations. And that's, again, why, you know, unless you start digging into ethnicity, that's, that's one of the reasons why BMI or waist to hip ratio is more or less predictive of something like uh, metabolic syndrome or cardiovascular disease. You have to take all of this stuff in, into, into account. And, and most of the markers that we use, um, again, are most predictive in Caucasian populations. And that's just the downside of many problems with lack of diversity in research every level and every participant in that research. And, you know, everybody else is just sort of catching up. So that's, you know, if, if you're not Caucasian, which I imagine plenty of people listening to this aren't, Sadly, that's just the case of, of where we are at the moment, and hopefully that will improve over time. But you can still do all these things and kind of generally know what's yeah, going on. Yeah, I mean, there. what's nice is that you can, all of these things are still going to be useful for you to track within yourself over time. So HbA1c is you know, a marker of your average blood glucose. Some people will measure an HbA1c and say, oh, this means that your average blood sugar was was this. And that's essentially a waste of time. You can't do that because it's much too variable within like if our HbA1Cs are both five, our average blood sugars, mine could be 100 and yours could be 80 and we'd still get an HbA1C of, of five. And that so then the, the HbA1C itself, if I'm comparing me to you, isn't very useful. Mm. But for me to compare to myself over time, it is useful. So sort of intra person it is a useful thing to track so all of these things you know even if we can't say a given cutoff is going to be optimal based on a given person we still know that they're associated with problems in that physiological system and that you know as you implement things and again starting by just putting that environment in place those things we talked about that you'll start to see improvements over mm. those over time and then you know that whether they're working or not and yeah, a lot of these things that we're talking about, anyone can do no matter their race and mm, absolutely get benefits from. Yeah. So it's not like, oh my God, I have to have like a completely new prescription for every single <laughs> butterfly or what's it called? A unique snowflake out there. Yeah. No, most of us are not unique snowflakes. That's that's what I've increasingly realized that. And that's what makes us human, right? We're a lot more... Uh, a lot more brings us together or is similar across us than sort of divides us or makes us different. And we live in what is now a very individualist culture. So we're driven to think that we are special snowflakes. But in reality, um, the things that we can measure, the things that we can do to improve our health is the same for everybody. It's generally the same. So just what's a recap? I love that testing within yourself is better than testing mm -hmm. against the population. So track your own body mm -hmm. and lipids yeah. and all the stuff like that. So what's a recap? You, you kind of listed a lot of things. What's like a basic yeah. thing that someone can do and how often? Yeah. So the basic things that most people could do, again, assuming there's not some specific problem that they need to focus on, going to be blood sugar metrics, basic lipids, what we call a comprehensive metabolic panel, which is like kidney and liver and then red and white blood cells. And that's like less than 100 bucks of, of testing, probably mm -hmm. closer to 50. Um, you could get it through direct labs yourself, or most family physicians would order that without blinking an eyelid. It's just like a standard list of things. And every three to six months would mm -hmm. be a, a nice starting point. But 
six to 12 months is is, is going to be fine. And, and in reality, probably more worth testing more frequently if you're actually putting, you know, changing something, right? Because mm. if you're going to keep everything the same and your health very slowly deteriorates in a manner that you can't really tell yourself, then you might see that, you know, over like a, you know, every, every 12 months. Mm, but if you're yeah. putting something in place and you want to know whether it's working, uh, focusing on a specific thing, then, you know, testing two or three months later is going to be more important. Cool. Cool. And then what about just easy stuff that you can see in the mirror, you can waist to height ratio, stuff like that, how you feel, like give people kind of a sense of some of this common sense type of stuff. Yeah. So one of my favorite things when you look at the research is that one of the best predictors of long-term health is subjective quality of life, Mm. right? So like, how good do you feel? How good do you think you sleep? You know, there's this whole big area of biological age, measuring biological age so that you're the speed that your body is aging is not necessarily correlated or the same as, you know, the number of calendars you've gone through or the number of times you've gone yeah. around the sun, right? And so you can do this very complicated and very accurate measure of biological age using um, epigenetic um, methods. They sort of measure the methylation on 513 different genes or areas in the genes. And it, that sort of gives you a really accurate measure of your of your biological age. Then there's the next step down where they can do it based on blood tests and actually using those blood tests that I, that I mentioned. And there's a, there's a really simple uh, calculator that you can, you can, you can find it online. You can just plug those in and that will give you a number. But even better than that is that almost as good as those is that you can predict somebody's biological age by asking them questions about how often they drink, how often they exercise, how well they, you know, how well they sleep, how good they feel their health is. So if you think that your health is less than good, that's an extra two years on your biological age automatically. Mm. So just tracking those things, am I, you know, does it feel like I'm sleeping well? Do I feel better? Am I moving more? Am I less reliant on alcohol? That, you know, is hugely important stuff and actually really does correlate with long-term health. So those are the things that I love. And I think weight is really difficult to track because, you know, hopefully if you're somebody who's starting a new journey of health, maybe you're going to go in the gym, you're going to put on some muscle mass. Uh, so your weight may stay exactly the same, but you could have a completely different body composition. So, me- you know, measuring your waist to hip ratio is, is a sort of a nice way of doing that. What's just sort of like your abdominal circumference compared to like the width of your hips? That's a good idea of, you know, where is the fat? What's your body composition? So some of that stuff, you know, super easy to do, free, um, mm-hmm. And it's probably telling you a lot about how a, you know a certain change is is affecting your health. Exactly. I like to pretend I'm in my 20s. Everyone thinks I'm in my <laughs> 20s. It's great. <laughs> I mean, I won't lie to someone, but yeah, just all these things, these perceived things. I playing sports and playing all kinds of stuff. I love that. And also, the, mm. what about the waist to height ratio though? That kind of because some of this the BMI is a bit deceiving. Where if someone yeah. carries a lot of muscle. Well, I mean, I guess even you don't have to do actual even measurements, I think. Yeah. Yeah, right? It's like if you have <laughs> belly fat, that's not good. <laughs> no. And and that's, you know, how do you look in the mirror, right? I mean, that's a it's a very it's, I mean, it's obviously a subjective thing and people who've struggled with uh, body weight issues previously as I did in my youth, you'll look in the mirror and you won't see what somebody else sees, right? You'll you'll see, oh, there's still some fat there and I still need to get rid of that. And mm-hmm. but again, for most people, like, do you think you look better in the mirror? If you do, great. Right. That's you've probably reduced your your visceral adipose tissue. You've probably improved your body composition. Um that's again for most people that's going to be enough. It doesn't require any any sort of fancy metrics to do that. Yeah, but then you always could do the next level and there's like DEXA scans and you can look at your visceral fat and do all that kind of cool stuff. But that's kind of next level. Yeah, and a lot of people are doing that and that's great if you're that involved in your health, but it's not a requirement. Like That's the important thing. Like All of this stuff is super interesting. You can get really into the nitty gritty, really into the details. But for most people, it's not necessary and they shouldn't think that there's this barrier of fancy testing or you know fancy other stuff that they need to track in order to see improvements when they make changes. Mm-hmm. Cool. And then what about like DNA testing? Do you think that's mm. worthwhile or like where are we at? Maybe we're not there yet. What do you think? Yeah, I think most DNA testing, like direct to consumer testing is a waste of time. Mm-hmm. And I've actually, I, I gave a talk about this at AHS last year and I have submitted a paper. It's currently in the peer review that kind of goes through my methods. And basically, if you look at both individual SNPs, so single nuclear polymorphisms, that's what you're measuring in your 23andMe or 
Gino palette or, you know, one of those other mm -hmm. sort of on the market consumer tests. If you then look at like, what's the likelihood this SNP is actually making a difference in me compared to if I didn't have the SNP, you know, it's maybe a couple of percent of people. Um, it's a really small effect. And then even if you, the most, um, or the largest to date um, polygenic risk score for obesity was published last year. I think it was 141 SNPs. And then they sort of weight them and they combine them into a score. And your score explains 13% of your BMI, right? And so like the other 87%, which is what you eat and how much you, how much you move, how much you sleep, you know, it's just so much more important that actually the genetics just just stop mattering. And it's, you know, if you look at people who are at high risk, genetic risk of obesity, if they just move for an hour a day, that completely eliminates that that genetic risk. And and, and similarly, when they've looked at people's genetic risk for cardiovascular disease, if you have anything approaching a healthy lifestyle, that's beneficial regardless of your genetic risk. And so that is eating better food, moving at least an hour a week was one study they looked mm. at. So it doesn't even, I mean, this requires you to not be sitting all day every yeah. day uh, and not smoking and not being obese. So if you're like, have any of any three of any four of those, automatically you've reduced your cardiovascular resist risk regardless of your genetics. And then like a lot of people sort of like dig in super deep. So like because of this snip, then this goes up or down and this is a supplement that you you should take. There is no research to support the vast majority of those recommendations. Mm. And so what I worry about is that you're told that this is a bad SNP, this is a bad gene. And in reality, you thinking that it's bad has a worse effect on your physiology than actually the effect of the gene itself. And there's uh, been some nice yeah. studies that have shown that. Yeah. Right. So if you're if you're told that you have a gene that's makes you worse at endurance exercise when you redo an endurance exercise test you will do worse regardless yeah. of what your actual genetics are and there's also if you tell somebody about their genetics of obesity that will change their their incretins their hormones of satiety in in response to a certain meal again regardless of their genetics so thinking something about your genetics because 23 and me told you so is probably you know, has a bigger effect than the actual gene itself. And there's there's so much negativity around, oh, your MTHFR isn't working, right? That's that's the case of more than 85% of us, right? And that's a negative thing. And automatically you're like, well, I'm a bad methylator and I need to take all these supplements. And it's just, it's just not true. Um, so I worry about the way we use that, the way we talk about it, because we're, we're causing a net negative effect when there really isn't much evidence to suggest that those, those effects are, are large or, you know, really worth yeah. about. No, I like that take because, and also even why waste your money and all this yeah. testing when maybe the same prescriptions are going to be valid anyway, right? It's like you're, you're yeah. saying, yeah, just exactly. do the same things, just have a healthy diet and lifestyle, move, like do the sleep, the sun, the whole thing. Yeah, when the advice stays the same, regardless of your genetics, then the genetics aren't useful, right? And and there's, you know, is there a specific intervention for this specific SNP? For 99.99% of them, no, there isn't. So again, you're right. I, I think it's largely a waste of money and, and the same principles will always apply. So there's got to be some benefit though. What do you think? What are we closest to figuring out? Or maybe is it APOE4 and the, like different mm. variations of that type of gene or what What do you think? Yeah, so <clears throat> APOE4 is the probably the one single gene that has the largest effect in terms of penetrance on a disease. So it, your, your APOE4 status explains about 5% of your risk of Alzheimer's disease, which is much, much bigger than, than the vast majority of other SNPs that people are, are looking at or thinking about. And the problem so far is that I don't think we've really come up with a good idea of what you would do in that scenario. So it's a it potential, so like, if you're just somebody who wants to know their risk, and you know maybe that that helps you change sort of like your overall environment is potentially useful. But there's also going to be a large group of people who are going to be told they're APOE4. It's going to make them worry that you know elevated cortisol, worse sleep, both of which APOE4s are probably more likely to respond negatively to. You've automatically <laughs> increased that person's risk just by telling them that they're increased risk, right? Yeah. So it's going to be. So it, it, it really depends on the person in front of you. And some people say that. Um, you know, being you know, being in continuous ketosis or high levels of ketones is going to be more beneficial for apoe 4s Some people are worried about saturated fat because it definitely affects lipid handling. So maybe being a low, you know, a high MUFA 
you know, high move for keto person is going to be good for APOE fours. There just really isn't any evidence to suggest that. So again, we're kind of like theorizing and, you know, maybe we'll know that eventually. And then we'll have like a targeted, you're an APOE four, this is what you should do. And I think because of the focus on E fours, that is going to happen, but I don't believe that we have it. I don't believe that we have it yet. Mm. But when you look at, so the, the food for me, uh, study in Europe looked at four different SNPs and then gave specific dietary advice based on those SNPs. And the most important thing, that they, and so the one for APOE4 was to reduce saturated fat intake. And the most important thing, and this happened in the four different studies, so they had one for FTO gene, one for MTHFR, one for APOE4, and there was a fourth one that I can't remember right now. But the most important thing that they found was that if you tell people about their genetics, it, it does not change their behavior. Mm. And there's a large meta-analysis came out a couple of years ago that, that said that. So if you are a quantified self, optimizer, biohacker, and based on your genetics, you will make sustained, long-lasting behavior, you know, changes in, in your behavior or in your habits, then it's potentially useful if you know what the thing you should do based on that SNP is. But for the vast majority of people, telling them about their genetics won't make them change their behavior, but it may make them think negatively about themselves and increase stress and worry. So yeah. for like 99.9% .9 of people, it's a net negative. But for, you know, some of the like really health interested people that, you know, there's maybe there's yeah. going to be benefit, but it's, it's largely going to be hypothesis generating. Oh, I have this snip. Maybe I should take this supplement, but you should really track to see where that's the case. Right. Cause at that point you don't really know. It's sort of just giving you somewhere to maybe start if you've gone down all the other environment lifestyle routes and still come up empty then as a last step to kind of try some other things that's where i've i've used it but again it's a very specific population of people in which that that's the case yeah we don't have the data anyway even if it was someone was going to make all the changes i still don't think we know this stuff and i was listening to paul saldino talk about this on a podcast it's super interesting talking about when these when you know these all these different things came to be like april 4 was the ancient one, right? This is what we had for all of human yeah. history. And then the E3 is around, he says like two to 300,000 years ago. And then the mm -hmm. E2 around 80,000 years ago. And that he was talking about maybe the, the APO4 people just are more susceptible to insulin resistance. And then that's the problem. It's like this Alzheimer's is kind of like an insulin resistance of the brain. And that these people are just more susceptible to insulin resistance. So the and so many people are insulin resistant in today's mm. society, and and right that's why it's all happening. So it's just you extra careful. And then what he didn't talk about was that maybe as we introduce more carbs into the diet, because maybe a long time ago, you know, Paul loves to talk about and I do too, and Mickey Bendor and all these Homo habilis and these ancient pre-human animals were eating highly carnivorous diets. And then maybe mm -hmm. as humans started cooking with fire, then maybe these changes happened and we added more carbohydrates into the diet and became more insulin sensitive, more able to tolerate this. And, and it kind of tracks with more introduction of carbohydrates to the diet. So maybe it's just the APOE4 mm -hmm. people just can't tolerate the carbs as well. Yeah, that, that's, certainly, that's certainly possible. And I think when you when you look at the research that exists on this stuff you have and it's the same for every topic you have to consider the population in which that research is being done so when you're looking at apoe4 increasing risk for alzheimer's disease in the us say you have to remember that probably less than 10% of adults in the us have good metabolic health right yep. so in the setting of poor metabolic health yes apoe4 is a risk factor for alzheimer's disease and i think it's probably associated with insulin resistance, but the metabolic picture that you see in people with Alzheimer's disease can actually be quite variable. So it's not always going to be insulin resistance associated. Yeah. But I think what you can say about APOE4 is that increases and prolongs the inflammatory response to a brain insult. And that could be large swings of blood sugar, or it could be being punched in the face. Mm. Um, and all of those things, you know, APOE4 is going to cause a more exacerbated or prolonged or at least different inflammatory response, which then long-term results in, in, in poorer neuronal health or increased neurodegeneration. And you then take it out of the, the modern context and you look at, uh, so the Bolivian semen A, is, there's, the, there's a paper where they looked at APOE4 status and cognitive decline. And in those people who had a high parasite burden, um, so they had, you know, had an infection, they had high eosinophils, high parasite burden, then APOE4 was actually protective of cognition. So mm -hmm. when you take APOE4 out of the modern environment, 
where people have poor metabolic health, where they're not sleeping and they're stressed and they have you know, low, a, a nutrient poor diet. Um, they're socially isolated. Then, you know, it's a risk factor. But if you take it out of the environment, is it still a risk factor? And we just don't know yet. But there is evidence to suggest that if you put the body in a more ancestral environment, and maybe that includes the odd parasitic infection, mm -hmm. right? Because that's certainly something that we had to deal with uh, over our lifetimes. Um, then it may potentially be protective. So it, it's all about the environment in which the study was done. And you have to put that in the context when you think about anything um, in terms of what, you know, what the long-term health is. Who's the population being studied? And so it's the same with genetics. So if you look at um, genetic risk of obesity, it's the same with type 2 diabetes and, and Alzheimer's disease. If you look at the genetic risk, even with people who have the lowest genetic risk of obesity or type 2 diabetes, on average, the lowest risk in the population are still nearly pre-diabetic and overweight. And that's just because in general, the population is sick. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at those effects on top of a population that's already sick to start with. So if you're not a sick person and you're not living in that environment or you've created an environment that is not like that, do these things still matter? I would argue for most of them, they probably don't. I like that. And I talked to Dr. Dale Bredesen on this podcast. Mm. He's an amazing Alzheimer's researcher and also, maybe this is my bias talking where I want to believe this is true because Alzheimer's runs in my family and that I believe that, yes, it's all the environment and lifestyle and how these genes can manifest. So, yes, maybe if I do have this APOE4 that I'm more susceptible to yeah, metabolic problems and insulin resistance you know, or this kind of thing leading to Alzheimer's. But no matter what type of genetics I have, I'm just going to do all the things I can to stay metabolically healthy and not mm -hmm. present these things. Yeah, yeah. And and specifically if you're thinking about Alzheimer's disease, so I've done Dale Bredesen's training course in terms of how to work with patients with cognitive decline and use his framework and his blood testing and all that, all the different stuff that he does. And it's, you know, super interesting and can get really complex. So again, like for the average person, I think that you probably don't need to dig as deep as, as he does. So if you're, he talks about like holes in a roof, right? If you have 30 mm -hmm. holes in a roof and they are, nutrients and toxins and sleep and all these other things right you need to plug all the holes if you don't want water in your living room and so finding those holes and plugging them is something that his framework does really well again it i think it's overcomplicated in, in in some ways but it's super interesting and you know it's kind of right at the cutting edge but what's i think missing from that is something that my friend dr josh turknet who's a board certified neurologist and kind of i work with him on, on on some things and he talks about the better off dead principle which is basically like at a point where you're no longer providing inputs to your body that are telling you that it's worth being alive and that would be you know actually using your brain if you're not actually stimulating those neurons to make connections and work with each other you can do all the supplements and detoxification and stuff that is in the bread and protocol but unless you're stimulating the brain to actually adapt and improve it's not really going to work. So you need to be continuously working on things that are going to stimulate either neurogenesis or new neural pathways. And that's going to be like teaching, learning an instrument, learning a language, learning complex movements or starting a new sport. And just doing Sudoku and brain training isn't enough mm. to get the brain to really think that it needs to be adapting and, and growing and learning. So you need to do complex tasks and new complex tasks throughout your entire lifetime if you want your brain you know, to to stay healthy. That's awesome. Yeah, that seems to be kind of consistent with the people who live long. That yeah, they're part of these communities or it seems like they're having this brain stimulation throughout their life. They're not sitting in a nursing home. <laughs> no, absolutely. Like that's the that's like absolutely the point where like physiologically and like it sounds really mean to say it, but physiologically your body might think well, I'm getting no stimulation from the external environment that I should be growing, repairing being alive, right? And then there's almost a feed forward cycle then, you know, like epigenetically or physiologically where, you know, your body's like, you know, what's the point of being here anymore? And, you know, that's the kind of sitting down all day with with no cognitive or physical stimulation is like the worst possible thing you can do if you want somebody to stay, you know, healthy, both physically and mentally. That makes sense. How does this tie into your research or does it at all? I mean, you're studying, well, you're mostly studying babies, I guess, but the neonatal mm. brain injury type of thing. And yeah, what, what's going on there? As I expand my research and sort of start, right, and in the world of academia, I'm still very junior. And so as I sort of build out my research program, what I'm really interested in is how do early life events affect 
long-term health, particularly brain health. So when you're looking at babies born prematurely, so we do a lot of research trying to um, treat the injured prematurely born brain, and nearly 10% of babies in the US are born prematurely. And even those who are only slightly preterm have, you know, 20 to 30% increased risk of learning difficulties or some other kind of developmental delay. So, you know, there's, there's a large percent of the population potentially going to be affected by being born preterm and, and the risk of preterm birth is increasing um, or has increased over the last few years. And so when you look at people born preterm, we're now like the first group of babies born preterm is starting to get into its 50s, 60s, 70s, because it was only really in the 70s that, that babies could be born significantly preterm and survive. And you see that they're at increased risk for pretty much everything that we've talked about, overweight and obese, uh, prediabetes, diabetes, potentially Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, chronic kidney disease. They're at much greater risk compared to people who weren't born preterm. And there's some slowly now data starting to come out to suggest that their brains age faster. So if you're born preterm and nothing happens early on to maybe... And so so the idea is that when you're born preterm, you, have, you switch on epigenetically a, a more chronic inflammatory state. And anytime you injure your brain... There's a change in the immune system of the brain that, that makes it more switched on. So then like every additional thing that happens to it over time is probably going to be like perpetually worse. And so it, can we, you know, so trying to find out, so what happens if you're born preterm and then maybe you play football or you play soccer or you join the military and you have a concussion or a traumatic brain injury, are you going to have a worse outcome from that? And mm. some people would theorize, yes, you would, but we just don't know yet. So that's something that I'm very interested in. And it's this, what can you do and when can you do it, implement these things so that you create, again, a robust brain in case there is an injury or, you know, something's happening and you are at risk of Alzheimer's disease or just, you know, preventing that process entirely. And this stuff, this risk is probably starting right before you're born. So then the group that I work with, I study, they are likely to be at an increased risk later in life. So how does that process work? Um, how can we intervene you know, how can we create, you know, a robust and resilient brain such that that isn't the case anymore. So that's, that's how I tie together, like, the baby stuff with the sports stuff with the chronic disease stuff, I think, mm. because what happens along your entire lifespan counts for what happens, you know, towards the end. Um, and, you know, trying to intervene and figure that stuff out earlier, how it affects you later in life is going to be super important. But just not many people are thinking about that. Because traditionally, you have the baby brain researchers and you have the traumatic brain injury researchers and you have the Alzheimer's disease researchers and they're all completely separate despite the fact that it's one system that's you know responding to injuries and they're accumulating over time and they're influencing one another so i think that's a that's a new and really important area of research that i hope to you know expand on that's great and this may be outside your area of expertise but why do you think there are more babies being born premature yeah um there's a number of things that increase the likelihood of being born prematurely. Obesity is one. Poor metabolic health is potentially another. It's anything that can cause a chronic um, inflammatory response in the placenta seems to, to increase the risk of, of, of preterm birth, either, the, the, either because the placenta doesn't form properly and then you get periods. Essentially, there's an emergency signal and the baby's like, okay, let's just get out of here because this environment isn't as good as I'd like it to be. So some kind of chronic inflammatory response certainly seems to play a part. So obesity, uh, potentially metabolic health. There's also disparity across ethnicity. So it's also more common in African-Americans. And there's also like a dietary component. So if you give women at risk of a preterm birth, a uh, fish oil supplement, you actually reduce the risk of preterm birth. And if you look at babies born preterm, they tend to have lower DHA, higher linoleic acid. Um, and that's also associated with a greater risk of long-term neurodevelopmental impairment. So like the fats that are around are going to play an issue. And that's, that plays directly into the inflammatory processes. This is a, a paper that includes some of this we published um, late last year. And, you know, none of that's perfect. But that's kind of like the the um, the information we have so far. So dietary quality certainly seems to affect uh, preterm births. And so I think that's where that's where a, a lot of it mm. comes from. I mean, I mean, there's and there's huge there's social factors, social stress, socioeconomic status, all of that plays a role as well. But I think just like the worsening quality of our diets and our metabolic health is probably playing a big part. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of like this Weston Price type of stuff. Is you know to have a good pregnancy, a lot of it is this nutrition. Yeah, like this DHA. You're talking about nutrient dense animal foods and. And yep. they all prize these and and just all the other stuff too, right? It's just our modern environment doesn't match what we're, our genetics are really set up for. So 
high level, what can people do for brain health for life? Like what's like the cheat sheet on, <laughs> on good brain health? I, I know that might be a hard question, but it also no, might be I, I think, everything we've ever talked about. <laughs> yeah, I think it's everything we've ever talked about, but there are probably some impo- like have the nutrients available, the brain you know, requires. So nutrient dense animal foods, super important. So as your brain is developing in utero, you know, assuming that you're going to be born at 40 weeks, um, then DHA is really important towards the end. But then after you're born, arachidonic acid seems to then take over as the fat that accumulates most in the brain. So that's going to so like seafood and then meat, super important both before and then after after birth and so continuing that if you're making a new brain you need to synthesize or you're repairing an injury you need to synthesize new cholesterol new lipids and ketones are the preferred substrate for that so babies basically producing ketones all the time doesn't necessarily they're usually in ketosis for like the first week after they're born assuming this is a healthy baby Um, and then like ketones drop down but they're continuously producing ketones because there's um, mcts medium chain triglycerides in breast milk so that's super important for building a brain Uh, and i think after a brain injury, uh, a state of ketosis or exogenous ketones, I think we're going to start seeing really good data in the next few years that that's going to be important in in adults as well, because they are the preferred, as well as being potentially anti-inflammatory or increasing neurotrophic factors, I think the brain's preferred building block of creating Mm -hmm. the things that it needs to repair an injury. So having the necessary nutrients is super important. I think if your sleep, incredibly important for long-term brain health. If you can avoid it, don't do something that's going to result in in brain injury. So don't uh, play you know, football like I did all my life. <laughs> don't play football. Don't box. Again, you know, if you're an Apo E4, try and find a sport that doesn't require you being punched in the face. Like really. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's a general rule <laughs> for life as well. So, but if you are going to be, you know, if you are at risk or you know, sort of like just in case, I think a good amount of dietary creatine is important. So creatine is a neuroprotectant particularly if you te- if you have it before on board before the injury and that seems to work in particularly in animal models across species and across ages so either that's because you're eating a good amount of muscle meat or you just take a bit as a supplement so mm. um, making sure you're getting enough long chain fatty acids so dha epa really important for a, a well controlled inflammatory process if you are going to get a brain injury creatine uh, potentially neuroprotective sleep so it's going to be nutrient density sleep Try and avoid brain injuries if you can, but if you are going to have one, then having those nutrients um, on board. If you again, if you get a brain injury, hyperthermia, getting too hot, is very bad for the brain. Mm. Ac- again, across ages, so controlling your body temperature, some early movement is important. So if you have a concussion, you will recover faster if you do some light exercise, but avoid getting too hot. That's very important. Maintaining a r- robust circadian rhythm again after an injury is probably going to be important, and then continuing to stimulate that system right is like like we talked about so if you want your brain to be functioning long into your life you're going to have to continuously stimulate it and as we learn a new task it becomes less stimulating right so people always talk about learning to drive initially it's a really complex task really difficult requires a lot of your attention but eventually people do it on autopilot so at that point driving is no longer the Mm, thing that is stimulating your brain so you need to add something you need to do something else so continuously stimulating the brain um, is is that final factor? So don't have the things that in, you know injure it or reduce the likelihood of that. Have the things that the brain requires both to work normally and repair itself if there is an injury, and then continuously stimulate the system. That's essentially the recipe for long term brain health, in my opinion. I love it. Lifelong learning is huge. Just always yeah. learning. I love doing that. And also, you mentioned the movement part as a response to a traumatic brain injury. Mm. But I'm guessing that movement in general would fit into the overall brain health scheme if we can get into some exercise stuff. Yeah, yeah, here. absolutely. Yeah, so that um, is both seems to protect uh, long-term brain health. Um, having good body composition, again, not being obese, having muscle mass is associated with better long-term cognitive function. And then exercise probably acutely stimulates the production of neurotrophic factors, which then tell the brain to to keep its neurons alive or to stimulate the production of new neurons in areas where where that can happen so yeah movement is is a critical part both for like the physiological and metabolic effects uh, but also because if you're doing more complex movements then that counts as that stimulating the neurological system so not just going in and doing the same thing in the gym every time is is going to be sufficient maybe learning some some new and complex movements over time is going to be beneficial and mm. i say that because i don't do much of that and i probably should do more oh, of that yeah. um you know I, I like what i do in the gym and that sort of keeps me going yeah. but 
for that the stimulation part is not going to provide that. Well, I know what you mean. I am a creature of habit as well, but I, I play a lot of basketball and beach volleyball mm. now that it's it's warm yeah. in LA. So that, I mean, it's different every time, right? It's complex yeah. stuff going on. And every second on a basketball court, you're sprinting at full speed. The ball's coming at you. Yeah, I think those kind of team or ball sports are going to be a beneficial lifelong. You know, if you're, you're beach volleyball, it's a continuously unstable surface, you know, continually changing environment. You know, that's going to be a nice sport to play, you know, as long as you can, because that that is going to count as a continuously novel, complex movement. You can't do that on autopilot. Right? That's the, I guess that's the that's the the sort of the acid test is can you just do this on autopilot yeah i can do bicep curls and bench press on autopilot but (laughs) i couldn't play beach volleyball on autopilot right so so that's a nice sort of acid test for it cool so yeah we know muscles and you know lean body mass is important as we age what else can we do i want to hit on this a little more just i try to you know talk to all different kinds of people about it and i like dr ted naman's sort of quicker workouts to failure but using body Mm. weights using compound movements what kind of things are you into and what can you prescribe for maybe the, the, the average person or maybe the more advanced person? Yeah, so I think for, for the average person, if we're just looking for good body composition, metabolic health, I think Ted Naiman's approach is uh, similar to Art Devaney's approach. Um, there's uh, Doug McGuff's approach. Um, so it's fairly simple movements done to failure, You know, maybe just one set or a couple of sets. And that's probably going to give you the like the minimum effective dose, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So beyond there, you're going to see diminishing returns in terms of what you get back. And sort of 30 to 45 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity is like that's the that's where you see almost all the benefit of exercise. So you don't need to do more than that. And there are some papers that suggest, again, sort of in the Doug McGuff, uh, James O'Keefe area, that if you do a single set, a long single set to failure, you actually get some cardiovascular benefits as well. So, yeah. um, so some of like you know Ted Naiman's workouts, um, your workouts, uh, Doug McGuff's workouts, doing something like that could probably take ten to fifteen minutes. You add half an hour of brisk walking, right? You're done. That's like that's all the exercise anybody would need to do to see the the majority of of long term benefits from exercise. Then, if you're trying to go uh, beyond that. Um, or if you are just starting out, I think there's benefits to some other things. So blood flow restriction training potentially has a big uh, benefit in terms of uh, the stimulus you can get without putting a large load on the body. So most of the research of blood flow restriction training, so you might you put cuffs on your arms and legs and you might do like sets of 20 to 30 reps, maybe like two or three for a given exercise. And you actually get greater muscle activation considering the amount of you know effort or load you're putting on the body. So mm. it's been studied quite nicely in people who are sedentary or rehabilitating from injuries, particularly I think in the Japanese elderly population. And then you could just do like, you could put blood flow restriction cuffs on somebody who's just in bed and you could just like create a bit of resistance against which they push. And that's going to be enough to create a muscle building stimulus without having to put any significant load on the body. So if anybody's at risk of injury or has an injury they're working around, then I think that's that's a really nice tool to use that where where you can sort of create a stimulus without having to really load the body. And then, I mean, beyond that, I think it's it's just going to come down to to what you enjoy. So, what's the stimulus that can increase over time, or continues to provide, you know, some kind of ongoing health benefits? I enjoy going into the gym for maybe an hour, an hour and a half. It's part. It's like my phone's not in there. There's there's no, well, other than for music. There's like I'm not doing anything else. I'm sort of like focusing on my time. It's mm-hmm. not really meditative, but it's sort of like that. You know, that sort of closed is my my time and my space. And I enjoy that process. But I am definitely the amount that I do in the gym is I'm definitely past the point of diminishing returns. It's not required for me to see optimal metabolic health or, you know, optimal longevity is I do it because I enjoy it. So, cool. so and I, you can build muscle. Least, I've always say yes. I'm not going to be like massive bodybuilder doing my 15 minute workout. But you I mean, if you enjoy it, this is a way yeah. to actually build more muscle <laughs> yeah absolutely and if that's a goal of yours and and i enjoy being the body composition that i am currently and i know at some point i'll have to let go of that because you would just you know you will lose some as you age naturally but it's also important to point that 
I find it difficult to buy jeans that my quads fit in. Yeah. And I think at that point, <laughs> I don't need quads that size to live a long and healthy life, <laughs> right? So so there's kind of a like, what is your goal? What are you trying to achieve? Do you enjoy it? All of that's super important. I'm not going to say that I'm going to live a longer and healthier life because my biceps are bigger than yours. I, I don't believe that's true. Uh, again, yeah. just doing what you enjoy for, for your own goals, that's, that's, that's going to be important too. But the the bare minimum, you know, the minimum effective dose is is really not that much, and I think anybody can and should do that. I love it. One more thing on the athletic kind of component. I talked to a few people about this because I'm going to do a decathlon again. I'm going to go up to mm-hmm. Toronto for the world's this time the world's masters championships, and they actually have a decathlon. Two days, ten events, all kinds of stuff, pole vaults, like shot put, you know, all these different things. I did it with basically fasted last year. I did a pentathlon fasted and I didn't really use any carbs. What do you think about this carbohydrate stuff for building muscle and for certain types of sports? I don't want to make it all about me. Apply it to, it, not everyone's doing a decathlon, but I kind of meant to dive into it for, you know, there's all kinds of different sports. People say, oh, I can't do like a keto diet because I'm doing jujitsu or I can't do it. You know what I mean? I'm doing, I'm like completely keto basically during the week and i'm playing two hours of basketball completely fine so i i don't know what sports do you think you do need carbohydrates for yeah i I think that the more and more research that's being done for the vast majority of people if you go on a ketogenic diet and you are on it long enough to adapt metabolically there's basically no negative effect on performance and you know resistance training endurance training you know sprint training it doesn't really, you know, as long as you adapt properly and you're eating enough calories, it's probably not going to have a negative effect on your performance. Whether that translates to like the elite of the elite in professional sports, I don't think we know yet because nobody's really, nor not many people are taking that jump. Mm. Um, there are plenty of people who are showing quite clearly that you can both gain and maintain um, a significant amount of muscle mass on a ketogenic diet. So I certainly don't have uh, concerns about that there. However, I think a decathlon is a nice example of a sport where I would consider carbohydrates and maybe even exogenous ketones to try and increase between event Mm -hmm. glycogen supercompensation or uh, regeneration because you have to compete in multiple glycolytic events uh, with short periods of time between them. So I think another example would be like the CrossFit Games where you have if multiple events in a day you need to restore your glycogen as quickly as possible if you're only going to train once a day and you're adapted to a ketogenic diet you will get your your glycogen stores back exactly. and most of yeah. most of it's going to and then most of your pcr or your phosphocreatine you know if you do a sprint is going to be regenerated aerobically so that that's your basketball uh, type performance i don't think that's going to be negatively affected but if you're doing multiple glycolytic events in a day i do think some kind of carbohydrate is going to be potentially beneficial just because you don't have enough time to regenerate your glycogen yeah. stores yeah i'm completely okay with that i was just kind of messing around and doing it last year <laughs> just to see if i could do it and and i felt great the last i mean it was only five events it wasn't super crazy mm-hmm. in one day you know the last one was a mile basically 1500 meter run and i felt fantastic and you know beat yeah. most everyone but okay we're going deep in this i love this episode you are a wealth of information i want to do one more quick thing because paul to bring him up one more time in this podcast (laughs) threw us some some topics and i am interested in this type of stuff he was talking about uh, uric acid and fructose i don't know exactly why he mentioned those topics but it's kind of interesting to me to think about those because some people ask me about gout You know, Mm. some people come to diet and lifestyle change because they have gout and they think it's because it's meat. It's like, oh my God. But I know tons of people who have gout who are eating high meat diets and they have no symptoms. So it seems to me that it's a problem with fructose and alcohol, that sugar and alcohol, the fructose part of sugar. So it seems like it's a liver problem, really. What do you make of this? Um, I'm not even sure that... You know, so you could say, so there are potentially metabolic issues with fructose. It says energetically demanding. It may cause some depletion of certain nutrients, which if you're eating a nutrient poor diet can be problematic. I think what I find really frustrating, again, the research sphere in general is that something that might be very normal in a healthy person or in a certain state, because it also happens in 
uh, somebody in the average person who is now metabolically unhealthy, or particularly as they get unhealthier, they're assumed to be equally bad at both ends of the spectrum. So one example would be physiological insul in insulin resistance. If you are somebody who's on a ketogenic diet for a long period of time, your muscles will become insulin resistant, as in they will not accept as much glucose as they would otherwise because they're sparing glucose for the brain. That's completely normal. It's a completely healthy thing. By you know comparison, a type 2 diabetic who is also insulin resistant, and you measure that by shoving somebody full of glucose and insulin and see how much glucose you can shove into their cells. Like OGT, um, yeah. Yeah, euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp. You basically put in two catheters into somebody's veins oh. and you infuse them with glucose and insulin. That's and you look at thing. how much... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's. I mean, it's much worse than OGTT. You're basically stuffing somebody full of glucose and insulin and seeing how much their body can take. Uh -huh. And it just like completely misunderstands what the role of insulin is in the body. But anyway, so like you'll see insulin resistance, quote unquote, uh, in both a healthy person on a ketogenic diet and somebody with type 2 diabetes. And they're assumed to be the same. Like what's bad in one is bad in the other. And it's just not true. And I think something similar happens with uh, uric acid, which is that uric acid is elevated or maybe elevated even more in people with poor metabolic health but as humans we have selected for mutations that result in higher uric acid levels we have much higher uric acid levels than any of the other primates we you know specifically seem to have lost the ability to break down uric acid with the enzyme uricase it's a very important extracellular antioxidant it's potentially linked uh, to a you know a number of sort of other beneficial you know things going on in the body so in somebody who's sick and inflamed and insulin resistant then higher uric acid may be a bad thing i think the inflammation that's going on is triggering probably the majority of the uh, uric acid crystallization in the joints that is gout and i think it has much less to do with the absolute level of uric acid so it's the, the overall metabolic health of the person that's stimulating the problem and then uric acid just sort of becomes the thing that accumulates. Mm. Uh, but it's not necessarily detrimental in its own right, because I, as we have very high levels of uric acid for a reason, probably because it's a, the most important extracellular antioxidant that, that we have. So, so I think most of what's going on is because of poor metabolic health. Um, and you're, as we sort of point the, the finger at uric acid, but it's only a problem or it only really accumulates or crystallizes because of the underlying health problem that's there. And if you, if you were somebody with high uric acid, but good metabolic health, which sounds like some of the people you're describing, I, I don't think that's a scenario where you're seeing significant gout problems. Interesting. What about fructose? especially against it or for it or what, what's your take <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'm especially ambivalent about fructose <laughs> okay. um and, and and so most of the things that the so uric acid fructose vitamin c was the other thing that paul mentioned that you'll yeah. probably ask about afterwards and it in general they're not things that i'm particularly concerned about and so fructose like i said it can you know maybe it's going to deplete body stores of magnesium so if you have a nutrient poor diet you know, and fructose may also be a more significant stimulator for de novo lipogenesis, sort of depletes intracellular ATP. There's lots of things that people focus on that are bad about fructose. And I think in the setting of caloric excess in somebody who already has full liver glycogen, so is already eating a high carbohydrate mm -hmm. diet and is not doing any exercise or fasting to deplete liver glycogen, I think fructose is probably a bad thing. In an athlete or somebody who is doing extended periods of fasting and by that i mean like 16 hours overnight you know maybe even 14 hours so within 24 hours of full fasting you completely deplete your liver glycogen stores mm. so if you are depleting liver glycogen either through exercise or just periods of not eating i don't think fructose is a problem because the first thing it's going to do is just replenish liver glycogen so eating fructose when your glycogen levels are already full and you're probably already sedentary and insulin resistant is probably you know, maybe going to be a bit worse than eating more glucose. But in athletes, in populations who are actually cycling intracellular glycogen, exercise, fasting, all that kind of stuff, or just periods of not eating, doesn't need to be true fasting, then I'm much less worried about fructose. Again, in the amounts that you yeah, would yeah. get from real food. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Well, this is all context dependent too, mm. right? Yeah, I love this where it's not black and white. Yeah, some people just think all fructose is bad. It's like poison. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh yeah. my God, I can't have any fructose yeah, ever. If, if you're an endurance athlete and you're not specifically keto or low carb, you know, if you have 50 grams of glucose after a long run, it's just going to go and be stored in your liver with, as glycogen and no big deal. It hasn't done anything wrong. It's fine. It makes you then able to do your next run or whatever. So, so yeah, in that in that scenario, I, I don't think it's especially toxic or worrying.
but it's just in the general population it's a problem because yeah, of all yeah. the well most things yeah. are a problem in the general population so that's why <laughs> yeah, yeah. well that's why i try to keep it simple i mean i always love to go into nuance but keep it simple it's like people are like oh why are you saying low carb i'm like well most people probably could use lower carb i'm just yeah, trying absolutely. to make it simple yeah. for the 88 percent of people who are metabolically unwell apparently yeah yeah exactly so Wow. Well, I really love this. I hope people stuck around to the end. This is maybe my new favorite podcast. Oh, and nice. yeah, I actually don't say that often. So awesome <laughs> stuff. I w- hope to see you in Seattle sometime. I usually come up for Thanksgiving. I don't know if you'll be around. Yeah, yeah. I, no- I noticed you were here this time. Yeah, Thanksgiving last year. But sadly, I also had people in town. So we didn't quite manage to make it to your hangouts. Maybe this year. Yeah, maybe this year. Yeah, we, we have like a meetup usually. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Keep doing your good work. And Thanks where can people me. find you? Um, most of what I do at the moment, you'll probably find me on Instagram. That's probably where I I uh, do stuff most regularly. So I'm at Dr. Tommy Wood on Instagram. Then Twitter, I'm also there at Dr. Ragnar, R-A-G-N-A-R. And my website, my personal website is drragnar.com, um, which is my middle name in case anybody wonders why mm-hmm. I have it. A completely different moniker um i don't regularly do things on those platforms so where you will find me most responsive and most posting is uh is on instagram so come and find me there and i'd love to hang out and chat i love it or you'll find them in the lab doing the work yeah or in the lab yes in <laughs> seattle i'll be in the lab <laughs> He's not messing around in all the social media that much. Okay. (laughs) Awesome stuff. Let's keep in touch. Let's keep this information going. Yeah. Thanks so much, Brian. This is a real pleasure. All right. There it is, everyone. Thanks for listening. Come back next week for some more with Alan Savory, the man himself. Until then, you can go to sapien.org and find out about all the projects. You can give this podcast a review on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app. You can share it with a friend. You can support me on patreon.com and catch more about the film on foodlies.org. Stay happy and healthy, my friends. Bye.